Okay, so uh, good morning. Um, this is really the first full lecture, which is going to be focused around uh, polynomial functors. Um, this incredibly versatile, um, accessible, uh, uh, sort of practical and uh, multifaceted uh, formalism for uh, for reasoning uh, categorically um, in areas of great practical significance. We'll be focusing on the dynamical systems side to it, particularly open dynamical systems. Um, but already um, you would have been exposed in the opening minutes of lecture two um, to some database uh, related applications of this uh, very briefly. Um, and it turns out there's uh, quite a number of, of other applications as well. I see I'm going back and forth between light and dark here. We'll see if my chair position helps. Um, so uh, we had talked about a few principles of that last time, which uh, to which I'll give a nod um, in my coverage today. But I am really interested in um, kind of pushing through some of the material uh, that was covered in lecture two, um, uh, critically notions of mapping polynomials um, between polynomials that will be the center of attention with dynamical systems, uh, the, the ways of combining polynomials uh, with uh, co-products and with uh, products and with uh, tensor products and ultimately with composition, although I'm not sure we'll get to those final two uh, today. Um, they will play a really big role when discussing some of the more uh, sophisticated applications of category theory and even more basic ones for tensor product with uh, wiring diagrams. Um, this is neat stuff, but it's it's also, um, as I noted, multifaceted. Uh, you can approach it through a number of different perspectives, which uh, uh, Nelson uh, Nelson Neo and uh, and uh, David Spivak uh, introduce, uh, and those will uh, many of those will follow us uh, through subsequent lectures here. Um, diagrammatic representations, uh, representations formally, symbolically, um, uh, and uh, ways to to consider consider them as uh, choices to be had, uh, etc. So, so let's dive into a little bit of this um, material. I've called this polynomial functors one, and I'm really reusing the slides from the last few minutes of last time, but um, but I've augmented them enough. Um, so um, these were some of the materials uh, that we had uh, covered last time, but um, we also have gone on to uh, this material and I should have uh, modified this, apologies for doing so sort of live here, um, but we've uh, been dealing with uh, lecture, lecture two and this uh, additional components of polynomial functors uh, book. So we talked last time about how polynomials we're considering here as functors from set to set, they map sets to sets. Um, and actually in the opening minutes of, of lecture two, you actually saw a category that wasn't set, but was mapped to set to uh, instantiate databases. Um, but in general, our, our focus is gonna be wholesalely on Polynom polynomials taking set as arguments and mapping it to sets. Um, uh, they take this y and they they add, they combine it, uh, the powers of it and add it together and with some um, some constants. We'll be diving into some some more of those things. And it turns out representative functors will form the kind of building blocks here. Um, uh, and uh, within the context of dynamical systems, we'll see that sort of positions of polynomials um, have a particular key role to play and they'll correspond to kind of modes of the dynamical system, not in the sense of normal modes or eigen 
eigenmodes of a system and how it resonates, but more the kind of regimes the system can be at the when it's governing equations change, um, uh, so to speak. Um, and uh, and exponents will represent uh, inputs. Um, there's going to be some notation that we're going to see, like p of one is going to indicate the count of positions and um, uh, or the, the set of positions and p back bracket i is going to indicate the the exponents. Uh, and uh, David and, and Brendan introduced six perspectives on polynomials, which I tried to sort of summarize here, borrowing directly from their, their table, but uh, adapting it. And um, this has to do with sort of different perspectives on the polynomial, what it represents, uh, what the elements represent, what the exponents represent. Um, two of those that we're going to be um, repeatedly going to within this session are this Corolla Forest, um, where we have this kind of level one um, trees or depth, depending on how you count it, one or two trees. Um, probably call this depth two, um, but the leaves are always just one level up um, at most from the from the root. And we can have these kind of degenerate roots. Um, uh, and as this sum of uh, powers, um, where the sum are, represent co-products, uh, these powers can be thought of as functions from P of I to Y. Uh, but when it's like Y squared, it can be thought of as like a pair of Y. Um, and why is a set? And this whole thing is a set. Um, these things are representables, a representable functors. And this whole thing is a functor mapping set to set, from set to set. Um, these elements um, here are the different values of, of i here. Um, and oh my gosh, I correct this one place. And evidently, I didn't correct it. This should be p of 1. It should be p of one down down here. Doesn't make sense as stated. Um, I, I evidently didn't copy my correction in all places where it needed to be. Uh, and exponents will be denoted by this. So p bracket i. It's just a choice of how we refer to them. We denote them with this. So p of one would be the exponent for term one, et cetera. Um, we'll see some examples of this. Uh, but there's many times where you'll hear myself and Nelson and David refer to positions in this, these successive positions. We'll talk more about that, but basically it's these things we're summing up um, and the directions will be sort of the choices to be had um, and, and it'll be associated with these exponents. Uh, the Corolla forest depicts those possible directions or those possible choices here um, uh, with these branches. Um, um, the, each branch, each of these kind of things sticking off is, is an option. Um, and this represents, as it were, a choice, each position. Uh, and we have kind of a menu here. Um, this Corolla forest will be a useful way to show it. And then in, in open dynamical systems, and I emphasize open because they'll be getting inputs as well. Um, these exponents will in fact represent those inputs. Uh, the outputs will be associated with the things we're summing up. I'll come back to this, there's a subtlety there. And um, the mode will govern uh, which, uh, uh, which of these terms we're actually referring to that we're summing up. At any one time, the governing the governing equations will dictate a certain thing we're summing up here, and its coefficient will be the output. Um, and then finally, there's this notion of, of uh, functions, um, uh, which is kind of this uh, mapping associated with what's called a bundle. Um, Shayan's been dealing with this terminology. Uh, and, and so these are the coefficients. So this is like, uh, two would be two here. This isn't for this exact example, but um, this would be like y squared plus y or plus two y. 
and therefore we have one y, two y, and then um, another uh, another one here, uh, and it's mapping down um, onto each successive position. This is going to be a constant coefficient, so y to the zero. Uh, so this is what's called a bundle, um, and somewhat confusingly, I think these things are called fibers. Um, sort of mapping from this to this. And we're kind of saying these two are associated with this position. This is associated with that position. This is associated with this position. And well, there's nothing to associate it here. Um, so this is Q of one. This is the set of all I um, or P of one it should be up here. Um, and uh, this is, we call it Q dot kind of a cute idea you know you take the derivative of this the pi's come down in front and then you plug in one to that and um oh man this should be p p dot of one not not of i um i don't know what, what got into me but um uh since you plug in uh p dot of one this shouldn't be Q, oh man, this shouldn't be square bracket. It should be a uh, curly bracket or, or parens. Um, but basically you plug in one here and this whole thing is one. The PI has been brought down by the differentiation, hence P dot. And so you're just summing up the PIs here. Um, okay. Um, so there are these bundle representations. This is for the same Value. And this is from David Spivak's uh, wonderful talk, um, which has some very advanced components, but some neat applications towards the end on cellular automata and so on. And uh, I think good basic coverage uh, very early on. So this is the same polynomial from three, three different perspectives. Here we have the algebraic form. Here we have the bundle form uh, where we have these, um, total of six positions. Uh, so one here, three here. You can kind of think of this as y plus y plus y. That's sort of these three. And then plus one plus one. And that's these two. You'll notice I'm expanding these constant coefficients um, into these positions. Uh, as, as we do. These are like sums of one and one, um, and one, one, one um, uh, times y. So y, y, y plus y plus y. Or it can represent as a Corolla forest where this has a choice between two things. This is, uh, these are associated with a single choice. And this is associated with two things with no choices. They can't go anywhere. Um, okay. So constants here, like this three and this two, it may be becoming obvious, um, are, are, are themselves denoting sets. Um, maybe that's not obvious, but this is actually a set. This whole thing is a set. It's a mapping from set to set. He just didn't write P of Y equals this thing. It's a functor from set to set. So it actually maps functions to functions, but uh, but if we deal with it only in terms of sets, so the objects is mapping a set to set. The set Y is mapped to this thing. Um, and this is therefore a set where these are co-products or disjoint unions where it's kind of like union, but but they're tagged for, for their position. Um, so we don't have to worry about duplicates. It's like a Union, but we don't have to worry about finding duplicates and saying we can't add it twice. Um, uh, I think we sometimes call that a bag in computer science. Uh, so you can have as many elements of a given thing as you'd like uh, in there. Um, and these represent sets. This is a set as well, um, and it's multiplied by it. Uh, we'll come back to that point but effectively it's like adding y, 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 and y. Um, uh, plus here is, is this disjoint union, which we write in this kind of funny union symbol. Um, and this multiplication involves products. Now you could think of this and um, 
I have a nice little um, thing here. Uh, yeah. So um, like 2y is equal to this. Now, you could think of this as like bool and y. I mean, equivalent like this, this is actually like the product. You see the product very explicitly. Um, 2y, you know, colloquially, we would write as y plus y as well. And it may be useful to think about it sometimes that way. But sometimes it's useful to recognize, hey, this is a product. It's a product of a set of size 2. I'll call it bool um, uh, and y. It's a product of those, hence, you know, two times y. And this product allows us to take any value of y when this is false, and then any value of y when this is true. So it allows us to store twice as much information because we can kind of toggle this first, this first element of the pair, this, head, this, uh, this left component of the pair, or head of the pair, if you will. And, and so we can store twice as much information as y. And in general, if we have n y, it's, it's kind of like having a set n comma y. Um, for each value of n, we can, we can have any element of y here. Um, y squared uh, is like y and y. So we can pick any y here and any y there and, um, uh, and, and we get y squared possibilities. If, if y is a set of sides two, we get nine possibilities here. Could choose any of the three for the first, any of the three for the second. Alternatively, we could think about this as adding y up y times, uh, size, of, size of y times. So we could think about it adding up a y, having a, a y here. Um, uh, or a y here, uh, or a y here, um, and and adding adding these up uh, y different times each time. Where you can think of it as unioning it in into this, so we're growing the set and growing the set and growing the set by y each of those times till we've grown it y times, um, and that gives us something of y squared. Y cubed is like this. And why do the n is like this? Um, and in general, this is going to be like a mapping from the set n to this. Uh, let's think about that for 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 y squared, for example. Here, for uh, it would be like a mapping from two to y. So, well, um, for either of the values of this two, like bool to y, when bool equals false, we pick a y. When bool equals true, we pick a y. Um, and and that's, that is basically picking a pair of y's. And so we have y squared possibilities. And the same thing is true with n. For each possible value of n, one, two, three, all the way up to the size of n, we pick a y. We have a tuple of n y's, and it's like we could store, you know, y to the n possible values for that. This is like a, a function, and, and it's useful to, to think about it like that. Um, okay, um, right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I need to dwell on this. Um, struck me as significant when I put it together. and I'm not sure it needs to be one of the highest priority things to explore. Just be aware of what you have said. Uh, we have this product structure. We, uh, we have uh, co-products and we have products. Um, products are like this, right? We have these projections down. You may remember this from the universal construction. For every product, we have projections down to each of the components. So we have from the first component to A, second component to B. Same thing from this one. And we have this initial object, um, excuse me, terminal object. It's not an initial object. I don't know what I'm doing there. Um, it's a terminal object. It's a terminal object. Um, oh, man. Um, 
it's a terminal object. Everything is pointing to it. There's a unique thing from it to this. I mean, after all, this is like one value. So there's kind of a silly function that maps this into a single value. And there's no choice in the matter. So you have just a single possible function that maps from all of these guys. In co-products, so, so by the way, that product thing accorded with this pattern, right? Or you have these projection maps down um, here to each of these as these sort of magenta things. Um, and here we have co-products. Um, and co-products have these injection maps. It's just the product picture flipped around, right? Remember that? And just the flipping around of it. And so we have these injection maps from these. We can either have an A or have a B. Um, and uh, within set, we get something like this. So we could eject this into there, eject that. And here, we this is an initial object. Um, it's, uh, there's a unique, absurd morphism from this function here, this one in sets. So absurd morphism that just goes to each of these guys. It's absurd. Um, it doesn't have to map anything. It doesn't have to do any work. It just is. Uh, it just, it's kind of a vacuously true. This is the, the initial object. It has a morphism to every other object and to itself for that matter. Um, Okay, now I want you to remember this thing about how many functions there are M to N. I should have probably done this uh, earlier. Um, you may remember that if we have M to N, and you could kind of reason it through, I always go back and think about the case of N being two. It's like assigning a bit value for each possible value of M. So, so it's like M bits, and I know the number of possibilities for that, it's like two to the M. I know it almost in my bones. So um, uh, I can count bit strings really easily. So, uh, so here we have N to the M different possibilities for something M to the N. Um, you could also think of that as like M functions one to N. And, and this gets useful for things like we think about Levere theories and so on. Uh, I don't think we'll, We'll dwell on it right, right now. Um, okay. Um, okay, so we have these functors. Um, remember a functor in general maps objects to objects, morphisms to morphisms. And here we have functors operating on set, mapping sets to sets, right? Um, so this is the co-product of, it's like the tag union of these sets. We kind of saw this last time. And this function is now a function between these things. Um, it turns A's into B's. And so it could map this set into this set. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and similarly for this function in their composite. Right. Um, so, Certain familiar data types, uh, they, they don't really talk about it much at all. Um, there may be you know, a, a, a tiny reference here or there, I think to list, for example, but familiar data types are volunomial functors, um, many of them. Maybe it is a polynomial functor. Looks like that, and it's just these two positions. Pair is a polynomial functor. It has a single position with a squared in it. It's a pair here, but it's like a pair of A's. Or as we said, it's like a function from bool to, to A. For true, it picks an A, and for false, it picks an A. Altogether, it's like a pair of A's. Uh, list of A is like a sum of one. This is like the empty list. A, that's like a list with single value in it of from set drawn from set A, A squared, which is like a pair of A's, um, 
AQ, which is triple of the A's and so on. These various higher tuples um, or various tuples. So these are polynomial functors. Um, hopefully they're friendly functors to you, but they're, they're polynomial functors. Now, some of this talk is devoted to a kind of interesting um, and thoughtful database application, um, which involves um, recognizing databases in their underlying categories. And, um, uh, and here we have a kind of a, a category illustrated and it can be mapped into sets. Uh, and it, it will illustrate, you know, the directions you can go from the moat, you can go left and right, or the directions that uh, you can go from the, uh, uh, from this uh, tower or what have you, the tower of power, or um, hopefully that rather than the tower of London, but um, uh, it, it, it kind of encodes uh, aspects of where you go to here. Um, I don't think I'll go into this here because my focus is on dynamical systems, but we may, we may come back to this. Um, and uh, it bears noting that, um, that these uh, illustration, that these points in this uh, category um, can have these map to databases. And then you have data migration functors that can map between these. And these things here can be labeled with, um, with these objects uh, in this category. And the morphisms are kind of the directions you can use to get from one place to another. Um, uh, this is the associated polynomial um, with some things having no place they can go to, some going uh, only to right, some only to left, or where you can only go left, and then, um, uh, and then somewhere you can go left and right. Um, okay, um, right. Um, so a polynomial in general looks like this. We're gonna use the term monomial for a special case of polynomials where we only have one of these terms, okay? And they're gonna play a really important role very quickly starting next lecture for dynamical systems. Um, they're gonna play a role for denoting wiring diagrams. Wiring diagrams where you don't have kind of switching of inputs for different circumstances, different cases where you're, as it were, your governing regime, your governing equations are different. Uh, we'll just have monomials. And uh, whereas if you were switching sometimes, like in the book, you switch suppliers of a widget or whatever, um, then you need different terms on this. Um, or if you have a finite state automaton, you can either be in an accepting state or a non-accepting state. Um, you're still taking input or you're like, you've classified it and you're done. Um, you'll be in different components here. But a monomial is very useful for representing um, sort of non-regime switching dynamical systems. Things where what they take as input their governing equations are different in different circumstances. Um, so uh, it's uh, it bears noting that you know the this final term here. Um, I probably have an example of it back here, like this term, can be written as you know there will be two times y to the zero. And P of one gives the sum of coefficients and P dot of one gives the sum of the exponents times the coefficients or the sum of the exponents across positions. Uh, okay, now th there's some subtleties here and these things tripped me up when I first went through this material. Um, uh, one of these lectures was posted by birthday, which was a rather nice present and I eagerly awaited this course. Uh, and um, yet there are some things that kind of trip me up and I, I want to try to wend our way through this to avoid you being caught up, um, particularly on your birthday. Um, so 
uh, we've talked about how to read these things. So we've talked about how co constant coefficients by these sort of rules can be unpacked as kind of sums of things. So if we have two times something, we could just kind of sum that thing up. So if it's 2y, we have y plus y. If it's 2y squared, we have y squared plus y squared. If it's y to the 42, we have y, y to the 2 times y to the 42, we have y to the 42 plus y to the 42. Um, and uh, it's very helpful. Well, I don't know what's going on. It's very helpful to keep able to translate back and forth between those. Uh, and think about them as packed together. Um, uh, when we are thinking about certain types of needs, it'll be more useful to unpack these. And very importantly, each of these is a separate position when it comes to kind of mapping, mapping things from one state to the other. Each of these counts as a separate position. You don't count the whole, the whole thing. Um, as a, a separate position. That's why you don't see a constant coefficient up front because you unpack it when considering the position. So this is a sub over positions and each position has a coefficient that's one. Um, so, so this is A positions, this is S positions, this is two positions. Um, but there are times where we will It'll behoove us, it will be useful and intuitive to think about these as kind of as a monolithic thing for a certain purpose. So when we think about like the outputs of a system, we'll, we'll think about this uh, potentially as, as being sort of an A um, and an output A. Um, and, uh, and so there we, we do consider coefficients. Um, the positions are always mapped out like this. It's just when we think about certain needs for dynamical systems, we'll kind of recognize that they group together. Um, I found that a little bit confusing, but it, in practice, I think it'll grow on you. Um, and you can just learn to kind of read these things. What's the output when we're in this certain circumstance? And you'll read this as like, oh, it outputs anything from a set A. We'll see that just next lecture when we start going through our first couple of dynamical systems like finite state automata. Um, right, so this position thing refers to which of these, you know, things we're subbing up with coefficient one. Um, to what, which of those refer, their positions refers to that, that set there. Okay, um, and each of these, is associated with a representable functor. It may not strike you as really obvious, but a term y to the a can be thought of as kind of that piece of it can be thought of as a functor from a to y. Um, and if we consider y the thing that is varying, it's from a, it's a comma dash here, okay? Um, so in, in set. So this overall functor, um, I, I wish I had a, yeah, I wish I had something that showed like P of whatever, where's, here it is. Like, oh no, David doesn't even show it there. This thing, well, uh, it's a little bit ugly, but um, this thing, if we had P of Y equals this, these things being summed up, um, if we unpack them, so two becomes, one plus one, or more, more compellingly, three Y becomes Y plus Y plus Y. Each of those Ys is a representable functor. Um, so we could think of this overall functor as composed of these sort of this co-product of, of these other functors, so to speak. Um, okay. Um, uh, yeah, and, and for dynamical systems, the different positions in terms of this expanded polynomial re represent these different modes of the system with, where different rules apply, okay? Um, and I haven't sort of thought it through, but it, maybe that's true for all of these. 
within this coefficient. The, the, all of those uh, belong to the same mode, and this is the output from that mode. I think that might be true, but I'd have to sit back and think. So these are these representable functors, right? Or all we do is we pick an A, and it will completely specify this functor. It maps A to CAA. It maps B to CAB. It maps C to CAC. And it maps F, which maps from B to C, to a function that maps CAB, the set, to CAC, that set. And how does it do it? Well, it just precomposes F. So with whatever the, is being mapped. So if it's a J, it's F, um, F after J. If it's an H, it's F after H. If it's a G, it's F after G. Um, okay. Uh, so these are these representable functors. These are all these representables. And those are these nice building blocks. And they have, and, and there can be some not like this that exhibit these natural isomorphisms with that. And you saw this picture I drew. Um, uh, okay. Um, so uh, here, uh, it turns out we have these polynomials and you, you may find this kind of flat so far, like, okay, so we have got these polynomials, that's kind of fun. Um, we have these rules for expanding them. There's these kind of nice algebraic identities, but yeah, so uh, what's the deliverable here? Well, the deliverable's coming up. First of all, these polynomials are really nice because we can combine them in ways. And so we can sum them up, for example, take their co-product and get P plus Q. Um, so if P is a polynomial and Q is a polynomial, uh, we add them together um, and we get like these, if we had this polynomial and this one, we could add them together. And you notice it, it it's kind of adding them in the traditional way, right? Um, each of these pluses is occurring as a set disjoint union. Each of these things is a set, but it, it, it feels somehow very, familiar and and comfortable I think um, uh, so you know here's a p squared another p squared term and we just add the coefficients and and so on and we get a we get the combined polynomial out now in terms of Corolla forests we're just kind of putting these forests together um, and uh, I won't quote Macbeth and and um, uh, what is it, uh, Dunsidane forest or what have you, but we have one forest coming to another forest um, and uh, we, uh, we put them together by, uh, by, we just make them adjacent when we combine the associated polynomials. This is the forest for this polynomial. Here's the Y cubed, here's the Y and here's the one and this is, 2y squared. You notice we've unpacked the positions here, just like in yonder thing. Um, and, uh, and then we put them together, uh, just like Dunsidane Forest. Um, okay, so there, there it goes. Um, uh, okay, so um, we can also, so we can add these, we could take their product, um, and their product is familiar quantity. We just do the product of all pairs of the terms, just like we did when we were young, um, and we get the product out. And um, here it's like uh, for a given position, uh, we, uh, we have a set of choices and we may have more of those, uh, you know, we may get, when we add it to something else, we may get three P squared, in which case we have these, but basically we, we have just the positions in the original polynomials. When we combine these, we actually get sort of combinations of things. And so as you'd expect, when you multiply, let's say P times P squared, you get a P cubed. And because the 
exponents multiply, right? Um, P times P squared. You get P to the one times P to the two, and you get P to the one plus two. Yeah. Um, so you could think of it this way. Nelson drew this out. This is kind of it formally, but you could draw it in terms of these corollas. So here's our corolla forest, right? This is our familiar corolla forest. There we go. On the uh, x-axis, or so the, the vertical axis here, y-axis, and here it is on the x-axis. There you go. Um, so now we're taking the multiplication. This was co-product, this was adding them. This isn't multiplication. And we put them in this nice little table and we multiply this by that. And guess what? We get um, these guys. So we, we have a choice. We're, we have a decision to make and we could consider Alice's decisions A here or Bob's decisions B. And we can choose whether we wanna um, ultimately choose it from Alice's menu or from Bob's menu. Um, Alice and Bob, you know, have these choices and we'll, we'll go with one of them from either Alice or Bob. This will be different from tensor product. Um, and, you know, we, we have these for all combinations here. So you now we have y times y squared here, and then another one times this y, y squared, et cetera. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so we're kind of delegating to Alice and Bob and then choosing one of their, their answers. Um, uh, I, I really should have included tensor product of polynomial. Um, tensor product of polynomial, we're going to get the coefficients be multiplied and, and the, the um, exponents be multiplied as well. And that will be like parallel composition. It'll be like, we're taking Alice's decision paired up with Bob's decision. We're considering both of them. You may remember tensor product featured prominently in our wiring diagrams, where we have this going on and that going on. And, and for wiring diagrams, it's like we have this wire diagram in parallel with that one. Um, and we'll have the product of their choices. We choose, we let Alice uh, have her options and Bob have his options and have every combination of them. Okay, now it turns out that these are good ways to combine polynomials. Um, we'll be seeing, seeing them um, coming forward um, in the dynamical systems context. But one of the biggest sort of most exciting components here, despite my yawn, is, um, is we have mappings between these things. Um, we have morphisms. Category theory is all about relationships. It's all about mappings and morphisms, um, how things are related. And it turns out these polynomials um, can be related to each other, can be mapped. And this will be absolutely central for dynamical systems. And in fact, with dynamical systems, we'll distinguish between two types of maps, lens maps, um, and charts, okay? Um, lens maps were kind of changing the interface. And um, charts will kind of map the state space of the system. Um, uh, it's kind of, uh, these are two different kind of morphisms. In fact, this will be a double category. Um, as often appears in David Jazz Meyer's description of it. Um, we'll have kind of horizontal morphisms and vertical morphisms, much as in natural transformations, we have horizontal composition of natural transformation and vertical composition. We'll have horizontal combinations of these polynomials and, and, uh, and vertical uh, composition of them. Um, and mappings between polynomials can be seen as kind of delegating decisions and then deciding accordingly or mapping between interfaces. 
And it turns out wiring diagrams will consist of morphisms between polynomials. It's, in fact, between monomials, not just polynomials, monomials, just single sort of components like two P squared or something like that um, will be will be the outputs of the wiring diagram and the inputs uh, um, might be, you know, uh, just P or something like that. Um, uh, wiring diagrams where subacure are fixed and therefore there's no time varying dynamics. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk about this mapping between polynomials. Um, there was some, Pretty nifty stuff that happened here, but it happened all very quick. By and there's almost a bit of well, there's some finesse there. Um, I'm not going to say sleight of hand, not at all. It it just it's just finesse. So we're considering in this. Okay, this is kind of the standard meta trick. You bump up the level and you say we have a category. We've been kind of in the weeds or in the forest, um, and we want to jump up and see the forest. The, the other force, the, the higher level force. So we want to consider P, poly PQ. So you see these in, in a category poly where the objects are, 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 are these polynomials, um, we have morphisms. Um, and these morphisms are mapping from P to Q. This is a HOM set in poly, right? Um, and um, Polly wants a cracker. And so we're going to give it a, a cracker. We're going to break this down. Okay. We're going to break it up into pieces. Um, uh, so, so all we're going to do is we're going to expand P. And look, P is, what is P? P is a polynomial consists of the sum of terms. So we're going to expand this out for each element and P of one, each of the positions will just represent this as Y to the PI, right? This is the definition. This is the exponents and this is the number of positions. I'm going to sum it up. And then we have to Q. Now, really, this is P of Y and this is Q of Y. And I got this becomes useful as we go to the UNA dilemma down below. So, so here we have Q of Y. And I would have written this with P of Y and Q of Y. Um, okay. So uh, the claim is uh, here that, okay, look, having a map, think about it this way, having a map from A or B to C, it's like having a pair of maps. Um, uh, one from, in, in order to express the mapping from A or B, or either A comma B in Haskell to C, it's the same information. To, to do that, you need the same information as a pair of maps from A to C and to B to C, because you have to be ready to handle either an A or a B. So you need a pair of maps, one from an A to a C and one from a B to a C. So this thing is, this, this, is it like this either, this, this um, sub. Um, this turns into a product. And this is normal sort of, symbolic trickery that that is common um and uh and it's true it's the same information it's completely isomorphic to it not this little isomorphism um so it's the product of these things okay that's kind of interesting um and then what we see is <laughs> this is where i guess so it's really sweet um okay look um you may remember the Where's my UNADA slide? Oh man, um, where'd, where'd my, oh man, where'd my UNADA go? Okay, well, I, I wrote it down here. Um, so look, you may remember that if we have something of this form, um, uh, for, all, for all Y, after all is P of Y, for any Y, we have P of, I mapping to Y, um, and we're considering that this is a, a function from P of I to Y, and we're considering how that relates to Q, um, then 
this is just to call it to Q of P of I. This, I'm, all I'm doing is I've just turned A into PI. I've turned X into Y and I've turned F into Q. Q is a functor. I mean, that's why it's Q of Y, it's a functor. So here, all I've done is, is substitute those things. So again, A became P of bracket I, um, indexing into the exponents P. Um, X is Y here, um, and F is Q. Okay, and it, that's just equivalent to f of p of i. Um, well, that's pretty nifty. So this whole thing, because of Yoneda, goes to this. And if that ain't cool, I don't know what is. I mean, that, that's pretty nifty. Um, you can kind of boil this whole messy thing down to this. Um, and, then, and then we expand this. So q is just a stinking polynomial, just, just a polynomial. So all it is is the sum up over uh, a bunch of coefficients, um, or excuse me, a, a bunch of terms of y to the whatever. But what's y here? Well, this is q of y, and so this is y, and so it's this is the y, um, the where to for and y. This is the y, um, and with a, the letter, and and this q. It, that's just the coefficients of this, right? Q of bracket this is just the, excuse me, the exponents of this, of this Q. And so we get this P to the I, Q to the J. And what this is really saying, as Nelson says, is like, look, um, this pair, this product is like pair. We have, a, we have, for each I, we have one of these guys, but what is this really? It's a, we have either, um, Q of, this is a J here, got kind of truncated. Q of J mapping to, to uh, P of I, uh, or Q of one mapping to P of I, or P, uh, Q of two mapping to P of I, or P of three. That's, that's why it's a sum. It's like you either have one or the other or the other. So it's like we have to select one that will map to P of I, pick one. Pick one. For each I, we select exactly one of these guys that will map to this. Okay. Um, so that's what happens. And this is from this wonderful talk by David, um, where we have these polynomials here, they're Corolla for us. And, and what we have to do is we have to pick, it turns out, um, for each. P, take it P of one, we have to pick a Q that it maps to, a, a, sorry, a, Q, a J in Q, a particular position in P maps to a particular position in Q, okay? Um, and, uh, and, then, and then we've got to have for each, for, that, for the associated exponent, it needs to go map down into the choices. So this is the choices for that position it maps to. I've got to map to the choices in the thing mapping to it, the thing at P. So it's like, um, so we, we choose, okay, this guy will map to this one. And then, so this position in P will map to this position in Q. And, and then each of these choices in Q, um, you can make any of those choices in Q, we'll delegate it to Q, um, delegating it. And then each of these is gonna turn into some particular upshot in P. So if we decide this in Q, we'll do the first thing in P. If we decide any of these three in Q, we'll do the last thing in P. We've sort of delegated it and you say, you tell me what you think I should do and then I'll act on it. And these are my actions uh, here. Um, as it turns out, nothing did it to the lonely middle choice. Um, uh, and then we, we have to do this for every, for every position. This position has got to go to one of these. Could have gone to any of these, but it went to this one. Okay. And then this, this 
decision has to go to some and okay, we'll pick that same one and we'll say, well, there's not much choice here. Um, we'll map to that and then any of these, well, they can only go to this choice. And then three will map to, to, to nothing. Yeah, it'll just map to nothing at all. Um, uh, now, David said like, it was kind of nifty. Um, I really like this intuition. So if you had a map like this, it's like you have a, a, a I always confuse this, a, a dice, uh, a die, a die, a single die. Um, sorry, no, this is like uh, First Nations used to have uh, these little things. It was like, it, it was like a two-sided dice. You'd flip it. Um, you can go see it in the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State in the at Nia Bay Museum. Um, and they flip, they would flip it. It was like uh, a two-sided dice, uh, a die. Um, uh, or it's like flipping a coin, right? Um, and uh, this is, uh, so if you, if you had to make a decision here with a flipping a coin, you could delegate it to a deck of cards and just say, if we get back an ace of spades, I'll consider it head, otherwise I'll consider it false. Um, or consider it tails, I guess it turns into a tail. Um, and, um, and with a, a die, a six-sided die, um, uh, I will consider myself as, I don't know, rolling a six if I get a, jack of spades or something a jack of clubs uh, uh and otherwise i'll consider it a one or something like that and so this this would be like delegating it to the cards um okay um i'd like to go on but it's not in the cards um because of the time um i did just want to say and and this was from nelson's talk i i stand to be flogged there um it's it's from this this talk um, there uh, and at this position of that talk. Um, uh, oh oh, what am I what am I doing? Um, oh man, now I'm in, now I'm in really trouble. Okay, yeah, there's for this one. Boom. Um, so uh, so the tensor product is just leading to this uh, product of uh, uh, of these coefficients and the product of the um, of the exponents, and this is like saying we will take a choice of from this one and a choice from this one, and it turns out we'll have the the output of both. So we have two think about two dynamical systems. Uh, this will be useful when we think about two dynamical systems in parallel. This is itself not a dynamical system because a dynamical system will be involved in the mapping, but, but this could represent the left side or right side of a mapping. And it's like considering both interfaces at once. So we have uh, this wiring diagram and that wiring diagram outputs. Um, we have both outputs and both state mappings to be considered because they operate in parallel. They don't touch each other. Um, they're both present uh, and we have to consider all combinations of them. Okay, so this is uh, lecture, lecture two. Um, so for next time, what I'd like you to go on to view is lecture three. Um, and, uh, and I think after that, we'll stop for some questions and discussion. Um, probably next Wednesday. Uh, but I'd also like you to look at sections 3.1 and 3.2 of this book, this general theory of interaction and polynomial functors book. Um, and, uh, and come prepared for that for, for lecture three. Lecture three is about dynamical systems application. We'll see it for some example dynamical systems such as finite state automata um, including variations in them. They'll show a simple version and then a somewhat more complex version that might involve mode switching, switching between governing properties. Okay, 
Uh, that is all for today. Thank you, folks, and uh, look forward to discussing this with you next week. Take care there.